You are listening to Proof Text, a Glossa House podcast by Dr. T. Michael W. Halcom, Dr. Frederick J. Long, Dr. Mario Melendez, Dr. Jennifer Noonan, and J. M. Smith. Welcome and enjoy. Hello, welcome back to our Ephesians Greek reading group. We're continuing in Ephesians chapter 2 with verse 8. Now here I have the Logos Bible software pulled up, and we're going to be picking up right here. I also will be showing you some notes in a Word document. Here is the one note, and last time we were diagramming, uh, semantically diagramming, starting in verse 4. And I think I'll, I'll start us by looking at what we did last time, just as a brief overview. 2, 1 through 3 is an incomplete sentence. It is anticipating the direct object of God's making us alive down in verse 5. So here, the direct object of the main verb, which is the main verb of, of all of, of verses 1 through 5, really is found in, in God being the actor of making us alive with Christ, so making us alive. And the the neat thing about this is that he's God is reversing our present state of being ontas dead nekrus and uh, nekrus being dead because of our trespasses tis perapto masin. So this is what has caused us to be dead. And God, in response, has made us alive with Christ. So in, in verse 1, Paul starts out by talking about you, you that is non-Jewish, that is Gentile, Gentiles. You were once dead, but in the course of his discussion and description of fallenness, he includes himself and Jews in that description. We also all lived once in the desires of our flesh. And so this human, sinful, fallen condition then is overturned by God who makes us alive in Christ. Now what prompted God to make us alive in Christ? Like what what are the dispositions in the heart of God? Well, that's explained in this participial clause right before the main verb, and that is that God was rich in mercy. Now, why was God rich in mercy? Dia, with the accusative. He was rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. So that's the heart of God that motivates him then to act in Christ, to meet us precisely where we're dead in our trespasses. And so in Christ, God reverses this condition that we're in and makes us alive in Christ. And then we saw how at the end of verse 5, there's this statement that's thrown in that breaks the grammar that really anticipates verse 8. And we'll, we'll, we'll get there in just a moment. So by grace, you have been saved. And this uses a paraphrastic participle construction with a perfect tense passive participle stressing the condition, the resultant state of having been saved. And so this verb, being made alive with Christ, then is connected with a ke to the next verb, soon a girin, he's made us alive, uh, raised us up, he's raised us up, and then connected with another ke, and then soon a kathesin, sat us together in Christ, in the heavenly realms. And so God has acted in Christ with these three verbs that are stressing soon, 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 indicating that this has happened with Christ. And now he seated us in the heavenly realms with Christ, in Christ Jesus. And all this has been for a purpose. And that purpose ha has been that his the the well the 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 superabundant wealth of his grace this is the subject that this would be demonstrated 
in the coming ages. So God is not done with us. There is a glorious future. So it would be demonstrated in the present ages and, I mean, in the coming ages, the epercumenus ages, eosin, that God is going to demonstrate this grace, his wealthy, his, his riches in terms of his grace. He's going to demonstrate that in kindness for us in Christ Jesus. So again, the key to this plan, God's plan, the key to it is Christ Jesus. Jesus is the instrument, the person, the agent by which God is going to bless us and extend his grace to us in the future. So this is quite a moment that he's reversed our dead, our deadness in trespasses. He's reversed that with this saving activity and these wonderful plans in the future. Now verse 8 picks up this theme again of you are saved by grace. When you have a repeated element, there's extra attention drawn to that. And, and so here our, our ears would become alert to the repetition. Now it's interesting that karati is, is not articular, even though the concept of grace has been here before, that now he says it without the article, and that would suggest stress, because grace is a known entity already in the discourse. But now in verse 8, he uses the article because it's anaphoric going back to the grace that now has been reintroduced on to the stage or is being emphasized. So that's another possibility is that grace here is being interjected back into the discourse in a new way. And then the article in verse 8 is referring that this grace is on stage. And this is the grace that we're, is being talked about. Okay, so in verse 8, let's go ahead and do some diagramming. I'm going to pull this down. This is where we left off. We see the gar right away. The gar is an initial coordinating conjunction indicating support. Now the te is separated from the kata t. I'm going to put it over here because it's modifying grace. So I'm going to, this just because this bothers me a little bit, <laughs> this is, uh, I don't want to, uh, there, get that, get that properly there. So the, the te is going with grace. Technically it's modifying the grace, but here's the main verb estesos mini. So I'm going to put that in the verbal zone. Now it doesn't entirely fit. Again, we have a, a, uh, a periphrastic participle construction. So the, the genius of the periphrastic participle is that it stresses the verbal attribute, the verbal action, the, the verbal element as an attribute ascribed to the subject. So there is no subject it is a null subject, so we can um, indicate that by putting a, a null sign. So the verb, the, the subject is implied in the verbal ending. It's indicated in the verbal ending. You, you are saved by grace through faith. Now, what is this grace? Well, this this is God's grace. This is God's favor shown to us. It's this is a dative of means. It's through this grace that we are saved. Now, some people might say, no, this is a dative of cause. It's because of this grace that you are saved. So you have a theological debate right here, whether this is means or cause. And if it's cause, then it would imply that the grace is the sole reason for you being saved, even despite your reception of it. In other words, if God gives grace, it's irresistible. It's an irresistible grace. You can't help but receive it. But from a Wesleyan Arminian perspective, grace can be refused. You can resist the grace. And God's not stingy with it. He gives it to people and he woos us. 
And sometimes we respond. Sometimes we act in a, in a way that aligns with that grace. Other times we're resisting that grace. So I think it's a means. It's by means of grace. God gives us grace, but he doesn't force it upon us. We need to receive it. Now here I think is where the dia pisteos comes in. The dia pisteos indicates, I think, our response through faith. Now dia indicates intermediate means. So while karati is the primary means, that is, that God's grace is supplied, we need to respond to that. And that grace is realized only if we respond in faith, in terms of receiving it, trusting it, and then living in that. Now that faith response obviously is predicated on God's grace. Like we need that grace. We can't just conjure up our own faith and just say, yeah, that's just me. That's, that's, that's wrong. The, everything that we do as human beings is predicated on God's grace. Our wills, our actions. In fact, that's what makes sin so condemnable is that it takes what C.S. Lewis says was an otherwise given energy and uses it for evil. That's a gross paraphrase, but C.S. Lewis says it very eloquently. That's what makes sin so heinous is that it was meant to be used, those energies, those capacities, us, our bodies, were meant to be used for good. And in fact, we know that God sustains all creation with his word. And so our existence, our even remaining physical beings, it depends on, on God sustaining his creation with his word. It's meant to be used for good. And so when we will it for evil, when we align ourselves with the evil one, when we embody that evil, that is particularly damnable. And uh, so uh, we must respond to this grace. This grace woos us to respond and to respond in faith. So I think the dia here actually is our faith response. So through faith. Now there's no other modifier here. And so it's, it's, it's rather pregnant in terms of, you know, what may it mean? What are we supposed to be inferring? Whose faith is it? Well, Paul leaves it nondescript through faith. And uh, I think we could understood this in terms of Jesus's faith or faithfulness. It can be our response of faith and faithfulness. And I think, you know, which one is it? I think it's yes. It can be all of those. Jesus demonstrated that faithfulness. We respond in like way to God in our faith and faithfulness, just like Jesus did. So I think these can be all together here. And the, the lack of any other specification invites a broad reading of that. Now, Paul continues with a ke. Now, this ke is a coordinating conjunction, and it indicates continuity. So there's not a shift here, but in addition being added to what is being said. said. Now, it's notable that, that there is no verb. There's no verbs here. This is not from ourselves. And what I'm going to do is, is put this underneath an implied verb. So the verb here is an implied is. So I'm going to type that out and uh, put that in the, the verb zone. And I'll add a little null sign that there is an implied verb. This is not from ourselves. I'm just going to go ahead and leave that on the same line because Paul is, is denying that this faith comes out of us, comes out of, he denies that it comes out of us as if we're the sole progenitor of the faith. No, this does not come from us. This is not something that we conjure up. This is something that God supplies grace for and that Jesus exemplifies. So this is not from us. Now what is the this? That's the that's the important thing. Well notice that the, the gender of this is neuter. The this is not going back to pis pistis, which would be feminine, 
nor is it going back to charis, which is also feminine. The this is neuter, and it probably refers to the whole of what this first part of verse 8 is. In other words, this whole salvific complex of grace and faith, this whole complex is not from us. So Paul is not saying faith isn't from us. He's not saying grace or salvation. He's saying the whole kit and caboodle here. This is not from us. In other words, we cannot save ourselves. We cannot supply ourselves enough grace. We cannot conjure up enough faith. None of this is from, from us. He says from you. Okay, so none of this is, is from you. But what does he say? It is theuto doron. Theuto doron. Again, it's a verbless clause. What is Paul meaning by that? Well, it's a fronted genitive. So notice that the theu is in a fronted position. And it's again verbless. So we'll put a, a, a null verb there. And I think the implication is as the verb is, then it's a null copula. And this is not from you. It is, and I think the, the implied subject is an it. It is, and then what is it? The, the statement is then that it is God's gift. Now I'm going to put it over here in the complement zone, but really we can understand this almost as a subject or as a predicate nominative. really doesn't matter to me. The point is, is that Paul is stressing the giftedness of God, that this is what God supplies. The fronted genitive stresses God's ownership of this, that this is something that he supplies. And then we're left looking at this, you know, what is it? What is a doron? Well, interestingly, in, in Leviticus, in the Septuagint translation of, from the Hebrew, to doron, the doron is the sacrificial gift that always is referring to what humans bring. Humans bring sacrifices. It's their gift that they bring to God at the altar. Never is it God's gift there. It's, it's what we offer. But here it is emphatically and expressively God's gift. God is the one who's supplying the sacrificial gift. So this salvation complex of grace and faith, this is not from you, from us. This is not, this is not come from human effort, but rather Paul says this is God's gift. And of course, we know what that gift is. That gift is Jesus. Jesus is the sacrifice. He is the one that is the sacrifice, uh, the gift of God. And we're going to see that this is played out really in chapter, the rest of chapter two, where it's the blood of Jesus that brings about the reconciliation of all people, both to God, but then to one another. So Jesus's blood and the cross, that sacrifice is, is the perfect sacrifice. That is the sacrifice that will unite everybody and bring reconciliation. In verse 9, then, there is ascendaton. And what we're, we're really having a piling up of ascendaton. We're having uh, assumed verbs of being. There's no, connect, there's no connection. I mean, we could really put the, the, the null sign right there, that this, this is indicating that there's no connector. This happens again. There's no connector. And so this is kind of a, a implied a verb. The verb imi is implied. So how do you, what, what is the subject? What do, we, what do we say that the subject is? Well, we might say it's this. So this is not from works. So I'm going to put the null sign in there again. So this is not from works. So I'm starting to see a little bit of a pattern here, right? So earlier he says this is not from you, the salvation 
complex or matrix is not from you. It's God's gift. Now he's saying that this salvation complex implied again, this is not from works or come out of works. And, and works, I think, is a shorthand for human effort. This has not come from any human effort or achievements. And this is then given an expressed purpose, why, why things are this way. And we can assume that God is the one who's setting up this whole system. So why is it that this is not from you? Why is it that it's not on the basis of works? Paul explains, and here I'm putting the three dashes uh, because these are modifying the implied kind of verbal idea here is, this is not from works, and in order that, so this is not from works, in order that no one would boast. So at this point we enter into a subordinate clause with an ena clause, and it has uh, its own subject and then verb. So these are relative zones uh, so whenever you enter into a, a subordinate verb, a uh, subordinate clause, these main zones here, if you're following me in terms of the semantic, this is called semantic diagramming, what we're doing, the, the semantic, main semantic diagramming zones don't apply. And so actually what, what uh, I do then is, is put subordinate clauses in two different shades of gray highlighting depending on how many layers there are. And sometimes, actually working with one sentence earlier, there were eight different subordinate clauses. So we had diff eight different shades of gray. Uh, isn't that interesting? Okay. So Greek can be pretty sexy that way in terms of uh, the complexity of the subordinate clauses. No, I have not seen that movie. I would not recommend that you see that movie from what I've heard. So that, yes, that was an illusion, but don't imply that I've watched it. Um, okay, so in order that no one, lest someone would boast, really, the, the ina me is, is lest. I think that's a good way to translate that, lest. And it's a little bit archaic in terms of English, I understand that, but it helps set up the translation so that you can get the, the tis, which is an indefinite pronoun, you can get that sense of someone or anyone in the translation lest anyone would boast. And this is a subjunctive verb with ina, and that's what you would expect. And this is uh, an aorist subjunctive middle. So, so God has set the system up of salvation. He set this, this matrix of salvation up for the purpose that no one, anyone, would not boast. Now that's remarkable. And really that's, that's a hugely important point, particularly when it came to the first century where you had ethnic groups, Romans, uh, whatever kind of other ethnic groups or citizen groups, there might be Greek and subregions, the Asian League, uh, Pergamum, uh, Attica, and, and uh, the Achaean League. Whatever, whatever level of, of group or human identification by eth ethne, whatever it might be, God has set up salvation so that no one, so that no one can boast. We don't have any edge on anyone else. Now this is the very point that Paul makes in Romans 11 that even though there's been this rich history with uh, Israel, that on the other hand, with, with God's historic people, he's leveled the playing field so that he can, he's brought all under disobedience in order that he might have mercy on us all. So there is, has been a salvi salvific historical priority on the people of God, on Israel. On the other hand, this, now, this message is now extended to the Gentiles, 
and Israel is comprised of believing Jews and believing Gentiles together as the one olive tree. And that's his point in Romans 11, is if wild branches grafted into the olive tree, which goes back to the promise of God and the patriarchs. And so Paul is a part of that, and he's praying for his kinsfolk according to the flesh. He wishes he could be accursed for them so that they could be grafted back in. So if they're cut off by unbelief, but they can very easily be grafted back in, in in belief. And this is all happening. This is the mystery of the gospel, is that Christ's coming has opened up the entryway into the people of God. And Paul here is explaining that God has set up this salvation matrix so that no one has a boast. No one can claim, oh, it's based on my works. Oh, it's because of my ethnic group or it's because of, of what we have achieved or, you know, we have special genetic privilege or we have whatever. It doesn't matter anymore. God has, has evened that playing field completely in the gospel. So there is no more reasons for boasting. It's all foolishness and refuse, Paul says in Philippians. It's refuse to him what he was, what he could boast in. And the same thing applies to us today. It's, it's rubbish what we can boast in, what we might lay claim to as if somehow by us being a certain way, having this certain kind of degree, having this personality type, wearing this kind of clothes, having this kind of status symbols, the list goes on and on. None of that matters. None of that matters. None of that is part of the salvation matrix. None of that is going to save you. Doesn't give honor to the God. God has set it up a certain way, and he's pointed us to Christ, and we are to grow up and to be like him. Now, this point is, is reiterated through a substantiation in verse 10. So gar is the connecting con uh, conjunction. And here we have the av to, the genitive, put way into forward position. Moreover, it's, it's discontinuous or separated from what it modifies. The avtu is modifying the, the word pima, piema. Piema is a work, or it can be used in the plural to refer to a poem and verse. It's a very interesting word here. And what I'm going to actually do, just because of the the location of this watermark, I'm going to move all this down here so that we can see. So we are his workmanship, and that's often how it's translated. Now, why is Paul describing it in this way? What I would say is that there's a lot of stress on the ownership. The reason why, uh, and this is the of two personal pronoun is going back to God. It's stressed because of a far forward placement, and it's also separated or discontinuous with the noun, the head noun that it's modifying. So there's a lot of stress on who, whose we are, and and so Paul. Notice that Paul, starting in verse eight, is using the verb imi, or implying it. This is very definitional. This is very, he's slowing down the discourse. Remember how complex this was, superly complex. Verse 4, 5, and 6, 7, uh, verses 1 through 3, extremely complex. And in fact, this is like suspended and doesn't even make sense until it's picked back up down in verse 5. Now, in verses 8, 9, and 10, Paul is becoming real simple, really terse. He's even using some ascenditon here. It's abutting ideas. It's, it's snappy. It's quick and definitional. What I would suggest to you is that 8, 9, and 10 is the thesis statement for Ephesians. And I'll show you some justification for that in what follows. Okay, so what we have here then is a definitional statement of who we are. So Esmin is we are. We are the work of God. And then we have this post-nuclear participle, 
which is a participle that is post-placed and indicating more about what it what it means for us to be God's creation or workmanship. So if I can get this aligned properly. So we are God's workmanship, and then we have this post-nuclear verb, placed participle, katisthentes, in Christ Jesus. Created. Now, it's translated as created, but I would suggest to you that this verb has a larger semantic field. Namely, one of the establishment or founding of a people group. And all you have to do is go to LSJ and, and look at that. If I were to click on this verb, here it is in our text. Go to LSJ, and there at the bottom it says, To people a country, build houses and city in it, of a city to found or build. This verb is found across the literature and in inscriptions, and its cognate, katistes, is a founder. It's a founder of a place, a city, a group, a cult, an institution. It is a really important, broad concept in the ancient world. So when we translate this as create, we, we don't fully understand the social political implications of what this term signifies. So I would suggest that it refers to the establishment of a people group, and that is us. That is those who are believing in Christ, that we become a people group that God creates as his piema, his piema, his poem. His, his great epic work, actually. Now, what got me onto this way of reading the verse had to do with this epi clause, epi ergis agitis. Often this is translated as purpose, for, he created us in Christ Jesus for good deeds, but this is not a normal use of epi. In fact, it's very rare if you go to BDAG, the lexicon, you can find it down there that they give maybe four instances of a purpose use of epi with the dative. And I think those instances actually are disputed. They're not at all clear. I think rather, more commonly, we think of upon or on the basis of. And so what I would suggest to you is that we translate this, that we are founded, we are God's workmanship founded, in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, upon good deeds. Now, what are these good deeds? Who is doing these good deeds? Well, I think the good deeds are Jesus's good deeds. These are works that Jesus accomplishes. And so this, um, the ease here is, is a relative pronoun clause, which begins an elaboration of what these ergis are. These ergis are described as agathis, that is good. And so I'm going to go ahead and align it underneath there so you can see that it's a modifier. So in this semantic uh, method of diagramming, what I'm doing is I'm putting modifiers underneath or above what they're modifying, indented by three spaces. And so that's why I have these little dashes here is so I can help see visually what's modifying what and how are they aligned. And you can see that there's a real beautiful structure that begins to emerge when I do that. So these good deeds, whose good deeds? Who, who is doing these good deeds? Well, I think Jesus has done these good deeds. These are good deeds, and this is what is the foundation of God's people. And I think we could also say that God has also promoted and shown good deeds in his historic people through leaders, through faithful individuals. The prophets, I would say, also called for people to act in a proper way, in good deeds. And it's these good deeds which, is, God prepared in advance in order that we would walk in them. Now, what does it mean for God to prepare these in advance? I'm going to align the is as the direct object of proi, uh, proetimasen, 
and this is starting a, a relative pronoun clause. So the zones become relative at this point in terms of, uh, at this point, the, 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 the blue lines there don't, we don't follow them. And we're going to get a different layer of subordination going on. So I'm going to put this in gray, a gray highlight to indicate that there is a move to a subordinate clause and so the zones become relative. Here's the subject zone, here's the verb zone, and then here's the direct or the object complement zone. So God prepared them in advance. So pro has the sense of in advance. So what deeds has God prepared in advance? Well, if these are Jesus's deeds in particular, then what that means is that God has prepared the deeds of Jesus and Jesus, remember, fulfills the law. So the, the deeds that Jesus is doing is a fulfillment of the law, which is the revelation of God, God's instruction for us. And, and so really God preparing the, the good works in advance is simply what he's already revealed and brought to fulfillment and culmination in Jesus. So these are the good deeds that God has prepared in advance. That's what he's prepared and why has he prepared them? Well, here we have the Ena clause. Now this Ena prepares and, and, and sets up a, another subordinate clause within the subordinate clause, a relative pronoun clause. So here we're getting the verb peripatesomen, which is subjunctive, and I'm going to align it after its conjunction. There is a null subject. It's implied or indicated by the ending. And then we have the prepositional modifier, in order that we would walk in them. Avtis is going back to ergis agathis. And so God has prepared these good deeds, which Jesus exemplified. He prepared these for us in order that we, as his piema, piema, that we as his work or creation would walk in them. Now this is a grand story. This is a grand narrative that we're a part of. We are God's workmanship. We belong to God. He's the one who's created us and brought us into being. It, there's a foundation. We have been, he's founded a, a people group and we are that work. And there is a political head, a ruler for us who exemplified good deeds. And this is God's plan is that we walk in these good deeds. This is God's purpose. This is what he's prepared in advance. These good works which God's prepared in advance in order that we would walk in them. Now, I should just say another way to understand these good works which God prepared in advance is that God is going ahead of us in our lives, in our circumstances, in our respective communities in our places of work, in our homes, in our interactions with people, that God has gone ahead of us and is preparing for us to do good. That's how important good is that we do in the world, is that God is working with his pre-presence, his grace, his prevenient grace. He's going ahead of us, laying the foundation for us to do good. And if you have any question about this, I, I think if you began your day, if we begin our day each day saying, Lord, what good should I be doing today? What person can I bless? What action can I do? What instance of, of giving thanks, of encouragement, whatever. And I think that you will have plenty of opportunities to do that good. And I would, I would suggest that God is even preparing you to do that. And that brings glory to his name. Look at Matthew 5. 16. Let your light shine before people in such a way that they might see your good deeds and give glory to God, your Father who is in heaven. So God is working overtime to, for us, he's giving grace. He's wanting us to have a faith response and to walk in that faith in order that we would de do these good deeds. Now, this is a major narrative that Paul is describing here. And once I began looking at this, I began to realize that it's, a, it's participating in a larger narrative that is found across the Mediterranean world in, in terms of, of some of the core elements. 
God has established a founder in Jesus. So these verses, this is part of my commentary writing. I'm not done with this commentary. I'm still writing it. That he describes believers as having been created in Christ Jesus upon good deeds, to create and cognate forms are found in association with salvation and inscriptions, that is the political inscriptions back in the first century, to describe beneficial deeds, to establish, recreate cities or colonies. Summarizing, summarizing this usage is Werner Fierster. Firster, uh, he says, quote, in the New Testament days, the word group is used particularly for the founding of cities, houses, games, and sects, and sects, and for the discovery and settlement of countries. Founding is the task for the ruler, especially the Hellenistic ruler with his autonomous glory and his approximation to divinity. So this idea of, of founding, again, is ubiquitous. It, people would have understood what that term meant, and particularly in regard to the people of God. So here's another paragraph I have, and this is where it really got interesting to me because it connects to good deeds and a political ruler as well. So associated with founding and restoring cities and peoples are the good deeds of rulers who administer justice, bring peace, establish institution of law, and religious places of worship. Okay, now Jesus, we're going to see in 2.11 and 22, he is making us into a temple of God. He is establishing peace. He is, rather than bringing law, he is annulling law. So there's interesting connections here with the, the general uh, culture. For example, Romulus, okay, the, one of the founders of, of, of Rome, along with Aeneas. Romulus brings peace out of war, providing equal laws, places, and places the Roman state upon a sure foundation. Julius Caesar performed civic deeds in war and peace, but his greater work, opus, was providing his son, the emperor Augustus, ruler of matters for the human race. This is from Ovid. Augustus performs services, merita, and good deeds, benefacta. Augustus left us his res geste, deeds of accomplishment, and 35 paragraphs, etc., so there is a network here of, of topoi, of themes, of founding a people upon good deeds. And Paul is saying that God has founded us, his people, in Jesus upon these good deeds, and he wants us to walk in imitation of Jesus in those good deeds. So I said that these verses are part of the thesis statement well, we're going to see that 8 and 9 swirl around these ideas of grace and faith and salvation. Okay, that's the rest of chapters 2 and 3 are going to swirl around this idea of grace. In chapter 3, Paul receives grace and power, and that allows him to proclaim the gospel. At the end of chapter 2, Paul is going to describe Jesus as the sacrifice, the gift who sets up peace and establishes uh, salvation and reconciliation so that no one not on the basis of works so no one can boast so that's coming up in chapters 2 and 3 verse 10 is outlining the rest of the book starting in chapter 4 where the verb peripateo occurs five times starting five sections and this observation is, is seen by many commentators for example Harold Honer uh, makes this observation. So this is a very clear structural preparation for that positive description of walking and living in the right kind of way. So verse 10 of chapter 2 outlines chapters 4 and 4-5 four, in the beginning of chapter 6. So we've hit a major nerve here in these verses 2, 8, 9, and 10. And uh, well, I hope you've uh, enjoyed our time to get looking closely at this Greek text and I uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Interested in growing your ancient language skills but not sure where to start? Glosa House can help. From illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars, Glosa House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glosahouse.com today. Glosa House, language resources for the global community.